Hi there, and thank you for tuning in to this introductory lecture of what I expect will be a full semester course on advanced linear algebra that I will put on YouTube. Before we get started, let me say a few words about the course and what the big ideas are so you know what to expect. So um, this is a graduate level course on linear algebra that I teach at Clemson University. Now it is unfortunate that graduate linear algebra is often not taught in grad school. Um, it's one of those things where it's sort of expected that you pick it up either before you get there or along the way, which is unfortunate because it is a really important topic that underlines basically all areas of mathematics, especially applied math, statistics, and optimization. And most people don't take beyond just an intro course as an undergrad. Now there are a lot of ways you could teach this course. Um, there's a whole spectrum. On one end is the, is the more computational side, maybe a matrix analysis course where uh, you deal with pivot rows and pivot columns and upper triangular form and think of it that way. Now you still teach the vector space theory, but it's not emphasized that much. And there are some advantages to that. So um, the, the pure mathematicians, uh, Irving Kaplansky and Paul Hamos have, have said, actually I think there's a, this is Kaplansky that says uh, that we share a philosophy about linear algebra. We think basis free, we write basis free, but when the chips are down, we close the office door, we compute with matrices like Fury. And I like that a lot because they really preach the whole basis free theoretical setting, theory of vector spaces and linear maps, but at the end of the day, you still have to do the computations. So the other end of the spectrum that how you could teach a course is in the setting of modules. And a module is more general than a vector space, and it actually, there's a lot of uh, algebraic settings that are specializations of modules. So vector spaces are modules over a field. A uh, module is like a vector space over a ring. So a module over the integers is actually an abelian group. If you look at quotient ideals, those could be thought of as modules as well. So people say, well, instead of proving theorems in all these different areas of math, you should just prove them over modules and then specialize. And there's a lot to be said for that, and maybe that is the proper way to do things, but it's not necessarily the most practical way for people who just want the linear algebra in this course because maybe they are applied mathematicians or statisticians. So in this course, I'm gonna to try to take a sort of a middle approach um, where the theory is emphasized, but it's the theory of vector spaces instead of modules. And so it's sort of a Goldilocks um, class. That's the goal anyways. And the book that I'm using, um, I mean, I, I'll use several books, but I think the main one I follow is Peter Lax's Linear Algebra book. And Peter Lax is, is an applied mathematician, does computational PDEs at NYU. And so he definitely appreciates the applications of linear algebra, but he also appreciates the theory as well. Now, I also like Paul Hamos's classic book, Finite Dimensional Vector Spaces, and how he does multilinear forms and determinants. So I will actually um, closely follow his book in, that, in those sections. And then there's a few other random sources of books that I will use as well. I don't just use those two, but I roughly follow the first nine chapters in Peter Lax's excellent book. Okay, so I think that's about all I wanted to say ahead of time. Um, I hope you enjoy the class. Let's get started. Before we can define a vector space, we have to define some of the underlying algebraic structures. For example, vectors we can add and subtract, but not necessarily multiply, whereas the scalars we can add and subtract and multiply and divide. So underlying all of these is the concept of a group, which is a set G and an associative binary operation. By associative, that just means that A star B star C equals A star B star C. So examples of operations that we know that are associative are addition and multiplication, um, but things that are not are subtraction. So for example, five minus three minus two is not equal to five minus three minus two. 
So especially in this class, when you see this operation, it's either going to be addition or multiplication. So we first of all have an operation like this. Of course, it could also be function composition or matrix multiplication in more abstract classes. But for now, just think addition or multiplication. And there are three properties that have to hold. The first one is called closure, which just means if we take any two elements in our group and we put them together and we get something else in the group. The group has to have an identity element, which is an element E such that A star E and E star A is equal to A. So you apply it to anything in either order and you get back that thing you applied it to. So the examples that you should have in your mind is if your operation is addition, the identity element is going to be typically zero. And if your operation is multiplication, the identity element is going to be one. Now there's variants of this. If we're talking about matrices, the identity matrix is the zero matrix. It doesn't have to be two by two, but just as an example. And the identity matrix, this has to be a square matrix, is, is one, zero, zero, one. And of course there's, there's other, there, there's other cases for more complicated groups, but we really are just going to deal with um, basic things like the integers and real numbers and complex numbers in this class. So when you think identity, think it's either additive or multiplicative, depending on what the operation is. And finally, a group has to have inverses. So for all elements A in the group, there has to be some other element B such that A times B is the identity. So if our group is, is additive, like the integers, then the inverse of A is minus A. And if your group is multiplicative, then the inverse of A is usually thought of as, well, we often write A to the minus one, which is one. So you could usually you can think of that as one over A, so the fraction, which is one. Of course, there, there are some groups like, we don't need to know this for this class, but if you take like Z five, which is zero, one, two, three, and four. So one half, so the multiplicative inverse of two is something that when you multiply two by, you get one. So one half is not in here, but there, there is a number, and namely that number is three, that when you multiply two times three, you get one. And in this case, the operation is um, arithmetic modulo five. So again, not things we really need for this class. Um, but a group is a set with an operation that's associative, typically addition or multiplication, with these three basic properties. Now there's other things you can prove from this, like here the, this is technically a right inverse because we are multiplying on the right. Um, it, you can show that also B star A is the identity as well. Now it's not always the case that this um, operation commutes. So sometimes B, A star B is in general not equal to B star A. This is especially if, if you have like matrix multiplication, we know that A, B is not equal to B, A. But, um, and, and we'll definitely see matrices in this class, but the reason why we're defining a group is just so we can define a vector space. And the operations in a vector space are addition and multiplication. Finally, a group is said to be abelian if order doesn't matter. So if A star B equals B star A for all A and B and G. Next up is the concept of a field. If a group is a set with a single binary operation, addition or multiplication usually, and a field you can think of as a set with two binary operations, addition and multiplication. So we usually denote this as F or K. And because it has these operations, we need both the multiplicative and the additive identity elements. We say that they have to be different for technical reasons because we don't want the 
the one element set of zero to be a field that is really irrelevant in this class. But it has to satisfy the following definitions. Under addition, it has to be an abelian group. Under multiplication, if you exclude zero, the set is an abelian group as well. Because you know, you're not allowed to divide by zero. Zero is not going to have a multiplicative inverse. And what these things really mean together is that if you have A and B in F, then, well, you have their sum, A plus B in F. You have their additive inverses, so negative A and negative B are in F. And you have their reciprocals, so 1 over a, 1 over b is an f. And you also have um, a divided by b is an f. So basically, you can do arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, but not necessarily by 0. And of course, to do arithmetic, you need the distributive law, which tells us how addition and multiplication interact. So a times b plus c is equal to ab plus ac, always. Several remarks and examples. So common fields that we are familiar with are the rational numbers q, the set of all fractions, the real numbers r, the complex numbers c, and then zp, which is just the set 0, 1, 2, all the way up to p minus 1, and the arithmetic is always done modulo p, and this only works if p is a prime, that's for example z4, 0, 1, 2, 3, um, 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse. There's nothing you can multiply 2 by to get 1. So p has to be a prime for this to hold. Um, there's a lot of other examples. If you take the set of rational numbers and you do what's called a join root 2. So with the rationals, you can do arithmetic with starting with the integers and you get negative numbers and fractions. But you could, if you also allow yourself to play with a root 2, you can get all numbers of the form a plus b root 2. And that is a field. And it's not too hard to check that if, for example, 1 divided by a plus b root 2 you can take that number and you can multiply top and bottom by a minus root 2, um, sorry, a minus b root 2 over a minus b root 2. And if you do that and you simplify, you'll get a number that is in this form as well. Some non-examples. The integers, because we are not allowed to divide. So 2 does not have a multiplicative inverse. And similarly, Zn, as I described not too long ago, if n is composite, is not a field. The additive identity, as I said above, is always going to be 0. And the inverse of a is negative a. And the multiplicative identity is 1. And the inverse of a is usually 1 over a. But more generally, we can write a the minus 1. For example, if we are dealing with matrices or integers modulo p where there aren't fractions, but we will have inverses. Now we can define a vector space. This is a set of vectors. We usually write capital X or V with a set of scalars, which is a field, either F or K, satisfying the following basic properties. X is an abelian group under addition. That means you can add and subtract vectors at will, and they contain the zero vector. X is closed under scalar multiplication. So the first one means that V plus W is in X for all V and vectors V and W. And the next one means that C V is in X for all vectors x and all scalars f. That's what I mean by closed. And finally, addition and multiplication are compatible 
via natural associative and distributive laws that relate the two. So the associative law says that A times BV equals AB times V. Now this is something we have to specify because it seems obvious, but if we don't put it as a definition or an axiom, then we can't necessarily prove that that's always true. So that means our logical system is somehow missing that. So we, we need to include this in the definition. Next is the distributive law. There's actually two versions of this because we have two algebraic structures, both the vectors and the scalars. So the first version says that a scalar a times a sum of vectors v plus w is just a v plus a w. And the next one says that if you have a sum of scalars a plus b times a vector v, that that is a v plus b v. Finally, we need one more rule, which seems pretty basic, it seems obvious, which is that the scalar 1 times any vector has to be that vector itself. Now, it seems like this is obvious, but it doesn't actually follow logically from any of the previous rules, so it's something that we have to build in. Intuitively, how you should think about a vector space is it's a set of vectors. So think like R2 or R3 with the following basic properties. It's closed under addition, subtraction, and scalar multiplication. And then you have the natural associative and distributive laws, which you don't even think twice about. We usually just take them for granted. So again, addition, subtraction, not multiplication of vectors, but scalar multiplication. I'll leave the following as an exercise on the homework. These are things that we expect would be true, but they're not definitions, but we can prove them without too much trouble. So in any vector space x, the zero vector is always unique. So that's the additive identity in the group of vectors. Next, zero x equals the zero vector for all vectors x. This also seems obvious because, you know, zero times anything is zero in our system of numbers, but these are two very different sets. This is a, a group of vectors. This is a field of scalars. It's something that we have to prove, and it's a little bit delicate to do so, that the zero scalar times any vector is the zero vector, and it does follow from the rules of a of a group and from these basic properties. Finally, negative one times x equals negative x for all vectors x. This also seems obvious because it is true for numbers, but if you think about this, x and f, these are very two different algebraic sets which we are forcing to be compatible via this close under scalar multiplication condition. So what this says is that the Negative one is the additive inverse of the multiplicative identity in F. And if we take that and we multiply it by an arbitrary vector in this other set, then we in fact get the additive inverse of that vector. And that, if you say it out loud that way, it does seem like a minor miracle, though notationally it seems obvious but it's not built in to these definitions. It's something that we have to deduce. So it is absolutely worth it to, as an exercise, prove these three statements that they follow logically from our definition. Now that we have defined the central objects in linear algebra, that is vector spaces, we need to talk about what the structure preserving maps between them are. This is a common theme in mathematics, and in some field we have, not that kind of field, but um, we have a collection of objects that we are the main focus, and we have a type of maps that preserve the structure between them. For example, if we're studying group theory, the objects are groups 
and the maps are homomorphisms. I should probably say group homomorphisms because we can have ring homomorphisms. So if, so if you're studying ring theory, you have rings and you have ring homomorphisms. If you are studying analysis, your objects are going to be metric spaces. This is one way to do it. And maps are going to be continuous. Continuous functions or continuous maps. Of course, you can also study you know, inner product spaces, Hilbert spaces. Um, but this is just one example. Um, if you are a topologist, you are going to look at topological spaces. Those are going to be your objects. And your maps are also going to be continuous maps. Now, if, if you study manifolds, if you're a geometer, um, then your maps are going to be diffeomorphisms. And there's many other examples. There's actually a generalization of all of these in a field called category theory. The objects are just called objects. And the maps are called morphisms. The idea with category theory is to generalize this whole notion and say, what can we say about a setting when we have a whole bunch of objects and we have structure preserving maps? What can we say that might generalize everything that we know here? So this is, this is a fun thing to look into on your own time. Some people jokingly refer to it as abstract nonsense, but there actually is a field of applied category theory that tackles applied problems, and it is actually very useful in many areas of mathematics. So look into it on your own time. It is a lot of fun. Okay, so going back to linear algebra, the structure-preserving maps between vector spaces are called linear maps. Formally, these are functions between two vector spaces over the same field, I should say, that satisfies the following two properties. The first one is phi of v plus w is phi of v plus phi of w. So sometimes we say this is additive. And the next one we say is that phi of a plus v equals a times phi of v. So this just means we can pull out constants. And if such a map is bijective, then we say it is an isomorphism between these vector spaces. Alternatively, instead of these two separate conditions, you can combine these into one condition, that is phi of av plus bw equals a times phi of v plus b times phi of w. What you should think about with linear maps are things like matrices, uh, differential operators, and integrals. There are many more examples, but all of these are examples of linear maps between vector spaces, even if we don't realize it. And these properties, uh, you can I like to say you can pull apart sums and you can pull out constants. We do these without even thinking about it. If you have a matrix, um, then A times V plus W is clearly equal to AV plus BW. If you have, um, and, and similarly, like A times 2V is clearly equal to 2 times AV. Um, for differential operators, it's, you know, we know that the derivative ddx of f plus g equals f prime plus g prime. Let's just write it like that. I guess I'm mixing notation, but I think you get the idea. And, of course, the, um, the derivative of c times f is just c times dF dx. Now I'm really mixing notation, but no big deal. 
And finally, integrals, you know, we don't even think about it. The, the integral of f plus g is the integral of f plus the integral of g. And of course, the integral of c times f is c times the integral of f. So all of these are linear. Matrices are typically linear maps between vector sp spaces like Rn, whereas differential operators and integrals are linear maps between vector spaces of functions. Okay, let's do some examples, first of vector spaces, then of linear maps. So for any field k, we can take k to the n, which is a set of all n tuples of numbers, and that is a vector space, definitely not a field, where addition and multiplication are defined component-wise. So this is what you do when you think about, say, r, r3. You know, the elements are x, y, z, where x, y, and z are real numbers. So for example, 3, negative 4, and 0. Next, the set of real valued functions from r to r, or I guess more generally, um, you, you can replace r to r with, with a field k, but you know, for real valued functions, for example, if you take sine of x, that's a real valued function. Um, x squared is a real valued function. So this is a vector space because if you add these things up, you get a function. If you multiply these by scalars, you get functions. So obviously, the set of real valued functions is closed under addition, under subtraction, and under scalar multiplication. Now, you, you don't need to have real valued functions. You can have functions from an arbitrary set S. You know, this could be a five element set, or it could be an infinite set. It could be like the complex numbers or something else. Finally, the set of polynomials of degree less than n for some fixed n, where your coefficients are from k. Now, k is a field. You can't have just integer-valued polynomials because the set of scalars has to be a real number. Now, you can define that as an algebraic object, and it's something called a ring, but um, it's not going to be... Or it's a ring or it's a module. I guess there's different ways we could think of it, but in this context, it's only a vector space if your coefficients are allowed to be from a field. So I want to emphasize that this is less than n because um, it's a common mistake just to say a degree equal to n, but if you just say polynomials of degree equal to n, that was not going to be closed under addition or scalar multiplication. So x to the n plus 1, if you multiply that by 0, you don't get a degree n polynomial. Or if you add it, to x squared minus x to the n, you know, here you do not get something that is of degree n. So you need degree less than or equal to n, or you can just forget this requirement and just say the set of all polynomials, and this is going to be an infinite dimensional vector space. Now, I haven't told you what dimension is. Well, I haven't defined it formally. That will come in a later lecture. But for now, dimension is exactly what you think it, it is. This is an n-dimensional vector space, this is an infinite dimensional vector space, and this will be an n-dimensional vector space as well. Finally, I will leave it as an exercise to prove that this first vector space and this last one are isomorphic, and they're isomorphic to this third one if s is a set of size n. To get some intuition for why this is true, the polynomial of degree less than n can be written as a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, all the way up to a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1. So what characterizes the polynomial is the n tuple, a0, a1, all the way up to a n minus 1, which you can think of as living in k n. That's exactly what you have here, though the numbering is slightly different. And for the third one, if s is a size n set, suppose s is equal to s1 up to sn, then every function from s to k is determined by f of s1, which is some number, let's say a1, f of s2, say that's equal to a2, 
and then f of sn, say, is equal to an. So once again, every function is characterized uniquely by an n-tuple of numbers from the field k. Finally, the last topic in this introductory lecture is that of a subspace. And yes, that is exactly what you think it is. It is any subset of a vector space that is also a vector space. Let's do some examples going off the previous ones. So if our vector space is k to the n, then if we look at all n tuples where the first and the last coordinates are 0, then that's clearly a subset. And it's clearly closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Because if you add two things like this, you get another thing like that. And if you multiply this by a scalar, it also has that form. Next, if we look at the set of functions that are periodic and whose period divides pi, actually, let me change this up a little bit. Let me make this 2 pi just to make it slightly easier. Then this is a, clearly a subset of the set of real valued functions, but it's a subspace as well. So when I say the period divides 2 pi, I mean it divides into it an integer number of times. So like sine of x, the period is 2 pi. Cosine of x, the period is 2 pi. Um, sine of 2x, the period is pi. Sine of 3x, the period is 2 pi over 3. So sine of 4x, etc. And I should probably say when I say the period divides this, what I really mean is that f of x plus 2 pi equals f of x for all x. Now that, that doesn't mean that the period is exactly 2 pi because it, it just means that it cycles some integer number of times every 2 pi. So you know, it might do something like, it might be sine, it, it might be um, cosine, it, but, but it also might be 2 cosine of, oh, I don't know how many times I'm cycling, but it, um, so cosine of 2x, cosine of 3x, etc., and also the constant function 1, which is like cosine of 0. So it turns out that this is actually a basis for this space. Now, I haven't told you what a basis is, but think of it as every 2 pi periodic function, like something like this, roughly speaking, can be written uniquely as a sum of these things. And there's actually a lot of details that I'm sweeping under the rug here because what I said was actually false because there could be discontinuities and, and you need an infinite sum. Um, so this leads us into the field of analysis and convergence. But um, this is really a, a basis of, of the field of Fourier series. No pun intended. A, a Fourier series is a way to write a 2 pi periodic function using sine and cosine waves. So if you think about like a sound wave that can be broken up into fundamental frequencies. So this is also an infinite, an infinite dimensional subspace of the space of real valued functions. And it, it is a subspace because if you add to, if you add up like, I don't know, um, two sine of x minus three tenths cosine of five x, this is going to be two pi periodic, meaning it, it, it does satisfy this property. I don't know what the period of this is going to be, but it definitely cycles an integer number of times every 2 pi. Okay, next. Uh, the set of constant functions is a subspace of the set of all functions. So in this, this case, remember how every, if s is, say, finite, then everything is determined by, well, each function is determined by its value at each um, what I want to say, each element of the set S. So a constant function just means that whatever f of S1 is, say that's A1, then that has to be the same for everything. So here we really only have one degree of freedom. So this is a one-dimensional vector space. Again, subspace, again, I haven't defined that, but I think you probably know what it, what it is. Uh, obviously, if you add two constant functions, you get another constant function. You multiply a constant function times a scalar, you still get a constant function. So this is a subspace of this vector space. 
Finally, if you take the set of polynomials of degree less than n, and you look at the ones where all of the odd terms have zero coefficient, in other words, they only have even terms, then that will be a subspace. Clearly, this is closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Finally, we will finish with several definitions of how to create new subspaces from old ones. Now, we can actually define these just for subsets, though they won't be subspaces. But if y and z are subsets of a vector space x, then we can define their sum, y plus z, to be the sum of all things in y with things in z. Similarly, we can define their intersection, like we would in a normal set theory sense, to be the set of all vectors x that are both in y and in z. Now, while these are not going to be subspaces for arbitrary subsets, if y and z are indeed subspaces of x, then it's not hard to show that their sum and their intersection are subspaces as well. So I will leave that as an exercise. And in the next lecture, we will talk about spanning and linear independence. So stay with us.